Hello, I'm Susan Weinstein, Co-Executive Director of Families for Depression Awareness. Welcome to our newest webinar, Bipolar Disorder Beyond the Basics. We're so pleased that you could join us to learn about challenges that may be present when a loved one is living with bipolar disorder, along with strategies for addressing those challenges. Um, we've looked through the registrations. We found that you all have asked a lot of good questions, that there's a lot you want to learn. Uh, I do want to make a note to those people who are watching who are mental health clinicians that this is really designed for um, caregivers, primarily family caregivers, and hopefully when you watch, you'll find something that you can use in support of your uh, clients and their families. But again, it's not really meant to be continuing education for you. Uh, many of you asked questions that we will not be answering in this particular webinar because we've discussed them in our earlier webinar called Introduction to Bipolar Disorder in Adults. I hope you've had the opportunity to watch our archive version of that webinar. But if you haven't had the chance, you'll find it on the Educational Webinars page of our website. Um, whether you're watching both or just one, we certainly appreciate your time and your interest in learning more about helping someone with bipolar disorder. We're going to have uh, more of a conversation than a presentation for this program. And we expect that this webinar will finish within 90 minutes, including questions and answers. We do ask that you submit your questions throughout the program. Uh, if you want to be able to make notes and follow along, you can download a handout of the slides by clicking on the link in the event message above the main area of the screen, or if you're watching on demand, in the program description. After the webinar, please give us your feedback on our online survey. You'll help us improve our program, and we'll thank you with a free copy of our brand new Bipolar Disorder and Families brochure. You should arrive at the survey page after the webinar, but the link is also available on the Educational Webinars page of our website. For those of you who are watching in a group, we'd love to hear from each of you, so fill out a survey and we'll gladly send you the brochure. If you find that this webinar is helpful to you, please forward the link to your friends and colleagues. The recorded webinar will be available for viewing for a limited time on our website, familyaware.org. Finally, we hope you'll help improve the lives of families affected by depression or bipolar disorder by making a tax-deductible contribution to Families for Depression Awareness. Now, let's take a look at what we will be covering. Our agenda today is that we will um, first have our introductions, we'll cover some general principles, we'll talk about mood states and symptoms and strategies for managing those, we'll talk about some treatment troubles and tactics, uh, we'll definitely talk about caregiver self-care. We will have an extremely brief section on legal issues. I'll talk a little bit about Families for Depression Awareness, and we'll have questions and answers. So let me start by introducing our presenters. Dr. Martha Thompson is Director of the Family Development and Treatment Laboratory and an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Boston University. She's a licensed clinical psychologist, researcher, and educator. Her research and clinical work has focused on understanding how families cope with mental illness and developing and testing treatments to enhance family coping and improve the lives of individuals with depression and bipolar disorder and their families. She has received National Institute of Mental Health funding for her research and has published more than 60 articles and book chapters. In addition to her academic and research work, Dr. Thompson has a private practice in Boston. Welcome, Dr. Thompson. Thank you. We also are joined by Dr. Pata Suimoto, who is a feminist scholar, writer, educator, jewelry designer, avid bicyclist, and mental health activist. Pata is a member of a number of boards and committees, including the planning committee for the annual Asian American Mental Health Forum, and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention Community Advisory Board. Mood disorders are present in both of her parents' families, and Pada has spoken and written about her struggles with depression. She is a co-founder of the Breaking Silences Project, which you can learn more about at thebreakingsilencesproject.com. Welcome, Pada. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. 
And so um, uh, even though, uh, Pada, you are, um, you do have your PhD, we agreed that I will call you Pada. Is that still okay? Yeah, that's Dr. perfect. Dr. Suyamoto? Okay, good. That's fine. And um, Dr. Thompson, we'll just stick with Dr. Thompson. So okay. let's um, – now. Okay, good. Uh, it's great to have you here. <laughs> before we get into before we get into the um, you know the particulars of mood states or you know some of those strategies in particular, there's some concepts that we want to incorporate into the discussion early. These have to do with respect and autonomy and um, limits for um, caregiving. So, Dr. Thompson. Would you give some general guidelines about the interaction between a family caregiver and an adult living with bipolar disorder? Well, I think one of the things that's really important here is balance, is that balance, that balance between we want to promote the autonomy of individuals to uh, go in the direction that they want, to pursue their goals, and yet at the same, and, and make the decisions that they're capable of making, and yet also be involved to love and support those decisions. And I think um, it's a real balancing act in terms of uh, sometimes we really need to be involved when their quality of life is at risk, they're not functioning well, but when they are functioning well, we want to be able to back off and give them the autonomy to move forward. And I think, again, that that, that can be pretty challenging. Um, you don't want to be more involved than you need to be, but you want to be involved as you need to be. So, Pat, I don't know if you have thoughts about that as well. Um, I was just going to say that I think balancing the interests both of the person living with bipolar and the person who's giving care, and those the, those balances Absolutely. may or may not look the same, and they might mm -hmm. look different. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think one and, of the things um, that Dr. I, Thompson, uh, this is really, yeah. Go for it. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that um, family involvement, one thing we know is that family involvement is associated with better outcomes for folks. We do know that families are important and they have a lot to provide and uh, that their support is, I think, crucial in many cases. So, Susan, uh, Great. ready when you are. Yeah, no, that's uh, exactly what I uh, was going to ask you, so thank you. Um, so <laughs> what kind of advice can you give? What kind of advice do you, can you give to a caregiver about communicating with someone who has bipolar disorder, Dr. Thompson? Well, I think um, the bullet points that you hear, you list here are very good. It's important to demonstrate respect. Uh, listening is essential. Being calm and straightforward. Stepping away. These are, in some ways, all things that we probably ought to do in a lot of relationships. Um, but I think one of the things that I would really urge people to keep in mind, maybe rule number one, is that it's always better to communicate about the disorder when the person is not experiencing an episode. So a, a lot of what we uh, need to do is um, talk about folks, talk with folks when they are not in an episode about strategies for how to deal with an episode when it does occur. So we're always better off communicating in, in times of stability. And uh, because we do know that communication deteriorates a lot when someone is in a, in a depressive episode or in a mania. Um, so, Pat, I don't know if you have thoughts about Great. that as well. I mean, Pat, yeah, you were um, a think... caregiver for your mother. Yeah. Yes, my mother had bipolar disorder. Um, my entire life, so yes. Um, I think, um, you know, the things that are listed are, are, are pretty comprehensive, but I think really being calm and patient, and it's really hard sometimes as a caregiver because you don't, you know, you're frustrated Absolutely. sometimes. Um, and um, <laughs> you want to really respect their the fact that they're adults, you know that the, you know when my mom I you know didn't want to infantilize her I wanted to make her you know understand that I, I do understand that she is my mom but right now she needed help that I could give her um, also I think you know the idea that you know that person has a, a life that's bigger than their bipolar um, diagnosis and that you know we can acknowledge those aspects you know as well um, but um, you know when 
a person is in an episode, particularly a mania, you know, sometimes listening is more effective than trying to argue or to talk with them and really trying to be present in the moment. Yeah. Uh, so here we have some communication tips that apply to just about any relationship. Uh, when people are distracted <laughs> by their own thoughts, uh, it's important to get their attention first and then speak. Um, it helps to keep your sentences brief, your language simple, your message straightforward. Um, Dr. Thompson, does anything in this list really speak to you? Well, I think the thing that really strikes me about this list is the third item down, which is keep calm, don't argue. I think this is such an easy thing to write down and such a hard thing to do, um, especially during a mania, where you have someone who, who may not be making sense in the way that they need to, and they're certainly having trouble keeping calm. So uh, keeping calm is particularly important for a caregiver, but I think particularly challenging. And sometimes um, it, it may be really important to enlist, you know, some breathing or something that can really help you to achieve this. Because I think this is a real challenge. Is it breathing? Part. Yeah. So you I think sometimes, breathing. you know, you have to go to that, that, that place within yourself where you can maintain that calm. And I think it helps to remember that this is the illness it's, that's talking. And I think sometimes being able to, to, to make that separation of the person from their illness helps you to remember that this isn't always how it is and that this is part of the disorder. That, but, it, but it can be very, very difficult um, to keep calm in those kinds of situations, I think. Absolutely. Um, and but I don't know about that resonates with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, first, I think where it says allow them to walk away if agitated. Um, you know, the, the person was, and I think that's a really good advice. That's really good advice. At the same time, sometimes the caregiver, sometimes there were times when I had to you know, interrupt the interaction and, and say, I need to collect myself because, you know, it wasn't, it, it was just escalating. It wasn't helping. So, and it, it, and it was leaving me mm -hmm. sort of traumatized. So I, I needed to like take time, collect myself and then come back. So it's important to realize that it's not only the person with bipolar disorder that, you know, could take time, could have a little time out. It's also, you know, the caregiver. Um, and, and, you know, the, the other thing is, it's just, um, it's really important um to remember that, um, you know, it's not, as Marcy was saying, it's not the, the um, it's not the person, it's the illness and it's, you know, that's speaking. And it can be very hard because they're not thinking clearly. Um, and you need to, you know, I, I would mm -hmm. need to realize that when my mother would say something to me, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't right thinking. You know, you know what I mean? I, it, was, it was like she would say, well, you know, she would make these, so it should be insulting sometimes. And that I knew my mother didn't really think of me that way. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. So. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I think that, that, I think that the idea of not taking it personally is another thing that's really easier to say than to do because sometimes. Absolutely. Things that are said Absolutely. in the heat of the moment are um, right. are painful. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. And they so, feel very personal. Um, they feel very personal. Right. Um, so there's this book that I especially like uh, by Rebecca Woolis, W-O-O-L-I-S, named uh, When Someone mm -hmm. You Love Has a Mental Illness. And I took um, and modified a chart that she had in there and made it into this communication tips list. Um, I think it lays out nicely some of the issues with bipolar disorder and then some ideas that are really clear and concise about how to respond. For example, being straightforward and clear helps when your loved one is confused about what is real. Um, Pada, do any of these stand out for you? Yeah, um, I think one of the things is the overstimulation one, don't force the discussion. That came up a lot in my relationship with my mom, um, and because you know when, when a person is overstimulated, it's not a good time for discussion, particularly anything that's going to be remembered. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, you know it, it's important to listen sometimes and to, to encourage people to just take a little time for you know time out and not engage 
um, in discussion. Yeah, yeah. And and you, Dr. Thompson? Yeah, I, th I think the thing that stands out for me is this idea of when they're feeling insecure, being loving and accepting. I think being loving and accepting is very important. Um, but I think we also have to be careful because accepting doesn't always mean accepting behavior. Uh, accepting means, or and loving and accepting, I think means I, I love you for who you are. I accept that you're you're struggling. I uh, accept you for who you are. But I'm not always willing to accept all the behavior that comes with that. And I do think it's really important um, that one can be loving and accepting while setting very firm limits about what one is and isn't willing to tolerate um, in terms of behavior. And that uh, I'm sure that will come up again, but I think that's uh, a really important issue. I'm sure it will families. come up again, too. Um, uh, <laughs> we received a we received a question um, from someone's registration form that they really didn't know what to do in terms of interacting with um, their loved one when that person was having um, uh, hallucinations and um, uh, hearing hearing things in their own head. Um, do either of you have, or Dr. Thompson, do you have ideas about how they might um, interact? Well, I think that the uh, staying calm is important. Um, that's the first thing. But I think also giving very, you know, sort of clear and brief feedback. You know, some of the things you're hearing sound are not things that others are hearing. And I'm thinking these are symptoms of your bipolar disorder, your depression. And I think that um, this might be a really important time for us to go and get some help for this. You know, that, that's, so I think that kind of really uh, clear communication that, that reflects this is what I'm seeing, um, I'm calm about it, but I think it's an indicator that things are not going well for you. So I think it, that kind of uh, approach is probably a reasonable one. Will it, does it always, you know, work out as you hope? Maybe not, but I think it's, I think it's a good way to start. Okay. Um, so in the office, um, I, I was just going to say I think it's really important that people, um, un, you know, realize that this is really hard, you know, and you know, understand that. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, my mother had auditory mm -hmm. hallucinations, she had visual hallucinations, and, and you know, dealing with that could be very, very challenging. So. Um, uh, sometimes you just need to take a little time mm -hmm. and, you know, try to figure out what you're going to say after the emotional piece, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very frightening for people. Very frightening, I think. Mm -hmm. I assume both for the people who have bipolar disorder and for their families. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so um, in the office, sometimes we hear from people who are just, so overwhelmed that they don't know what to do and they say something like, this isn't what I signed up for. And to me, that points yeah, to the issue yeah. of expectations, that uh, mm -hmm. each person mm -hmm. has to examine where they are now, where they want to be, how they can get there, and how they can do it as a family, if possible. Uh, I see setting short-term goals as a way to work on expectations. How, to, how have you handled this? Um, it's hard. <laughs> uh, setting expectations is hard, particularly if, you know, um, um, particularly as the child of a mother, right, where the roles were sort of reversed. But I think I've learned a number of things. Yeah. One is that rec recovery from an episode takes a lot of time. And it's not a linear process, that good days, bad days, ups and downs, you know, I mean, it's not going to be straightforward mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and predictable, right? And I, you know, I learned yeah. this. It's a lifetime process too, because I'm not gonna, you know, my mom passed actually, but I'm not going. You know, I wasn't gonna abandon her. <laughs> you know, I was, in, you know, in it for the long haul. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, I didn't have to sort of make a constant assessment of myself and of her, and you know how our relationship, our relationship is going. You know, at both as mother daughter and caregiver, and you know, um, person who's who's distressed. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think, and, I think the other you thing know, is following I up on what. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Pat, why don't you finish? No, I was just yeah. going to say the other thing is that sometimes goals, setting goals is hard because people can't figure out what the goals, you know, the pa the patient, the, the you know, question, my mom couldn't figure out what the goal should be. So I had to step in and say, you know, short-term goals, you know, is let's get to therapy today or, or let's get to the doctor. You know, I mean, yeah. like keeping it very simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm done. So, uh, Dr. Thompson, um, how low do families' expectations need to be? Well, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of people living with bipolar disorder who are having very good lives and quality lives. And I think um, one of the things that when a person, person first has bipolar disorder, one of the things we noticed in working with a lot of young people and their uh, families was that um, we, we really begun to conceptualize bipolar disorder as a trauma in the family. It's this thing that sort of feels like a lightning bolt in a way. Uh, it it uh, gets in the way of all of the sort of shatters, if you will, in the short term anyway, the dreams that you had, the hopes that you had about this young person's life. And I think that um, you deal with it as you deal with lots of traumas. Um, you face it and you have to figure out how you're going to live a, a good life, the kind of life that you want, um, given that you're contending with this. And I, I, in some ways, I feel that it's not that different from a lot of chronic illnesses. So when your child develops diabetes and you say, wow, this is not something I planned on. This is not the kind of life I wanted. But that doesn't mean it has to be a bad life. Uh, but it's going to be different. And so it's going to imp impact us. It's going to require us to reconsider expectations. Um, is a person going to be able to finish school? Well, maybe so, but maybe they won't be able to do it in the same uh, period of time, uh, at the same place. Um, it may have to uh, – I think families often have to work together to create a new set of expectations, recognize their aspirations, and, and think about um, what that's going to look like. So I think, I think it's a real um, sort of coming to terms with – just having a chronic uh, condition that is, um, for some people, you know, they have long periods of wellness, and for other folks, they have more chronic kinds of symptoms. And I think there's, you know, in dealing with lots of families, I can say that families have very different experiences with bipolar disorder. There's not a prototype, if you will, because bipolar disorder can look very different for different folks. Actually, there's one uh, more thing, I think. Right. One is, can I? Um, I was just going to say one thing that makes us different than other chronic conditions, though, is the stigma around mental health illness, and that that's something, you know, when you're Absolutely. out there getting support, it's something you need to think about, and um, you know, just I mean, Absolutely. people experience it. That's just I just want to say it out loud. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has similarities to other chronic conditions, but it also has some real important differences. Um. Both of you expressed to me in an earlier conversation that there were two concepts that caregivers really need to embrace. Um, Dr. Thompson, can you talk about fault and responsibility? Um, well, I, I think one of the things uh, that's really important is that um, it's not your fault that your relative, that your the person you love in your family has this disorder, and it's also not your job to fix it. Um, your job is to support and be there. I think that's really important. But um, one of the things that um, we, we found in research is that kids whose parents have um, a mental health problem, a mood disorder, that those kids tend to do a lot better if they can sort of separate themselves and say, that's the disorder. It's not my fault. It's not my job to fix my parent. It's not my job to make them better. And yet still be able to maintain a positive and healthy relationship. And so I think, and I, but I think that's a hugely challenging uh, thing to do, um, to be able to sort of fix what you can, to be able to step in where you can, but to also recognize your limits and that you're not responsible for it. And I, I think this is a very, uh, this is very tricky for a lot of families. Pata, do you have thoughts about that one as well? Um, I think I, 
I mean, I think the thing that you were saying that you can't fix it. It's not, you know, you can't, you, it's not your responsibility to fix it, but you really can't. The, the person has to, yeah. you know, engage in their own treatment yeah. and care and all that kind of stuff, and you can't, you can't do that for them. Um, but, and I also think that, you know, I mean, a lot of times kids and growing up with this, uh, you know, I, I, I felt like, because the kid mind, right, psychologically speaking, the kid mind thinks it is their fault and that they, if they were only a better kid, you know, that they yep. would, uh, yep. it would yep. be better. But it doesn't work that way either, <laughs> um, at least from my experience. Um, and that I, you know, it, it was, I had to come to terms myself with what wasn't my fault, you know, that it wasn't my fault or there's nothing I I could do to change her condition I could just be there as a support um, you know to help to help her and Mm -hmm. um, I think this is also true for uh, you know parents I mean my daughter doesn't have bipolar but she had her own you know issues or mental health concerns and I mean I just wanted to fix it right as a parent I wanted to fix it but I couldn't and I had to be able to say all right you know we're in it together you know what do you need and listen to her and like all that kind of stuff when she was having you know concerns um but i think it's it's very similar Mm -hmm. all right i'm going to move on to the next thing um because uh, we're going to talk more than once about psychiatric advanced directives because we think they're really important um, especially for facilitating treatment and reducing conflict When someone's loved one is competent, she or he can articulate specific instructions or preferences about what they want their future mental health treatment to look like. And so the advanced directive will substitute for when a person with bipolar disorder is experiencing an acute episode and is unable to provide informed consent or asserts their non-consent. The care plan is the same idea. They're not necessarily as strong as the more formal advanced directives. The link that we've provided here is to the National Resource Center on Psychiatric Advanced Directives, which is a great resource. Um, Dr. Thompson, can you talk about what a directive might include? Well, you know, in working with families, one of the things that, that we've done is to, we, we call it a relapse drill. And that's basically, you guys sort of, we, we say something People will say, well, I don't, I don't want to do this because I'm not going to have another episode. It's not going to happen. You say, you know, that's, that's good, and I'd like to believe that's true. That's, we hope that that's the case. But like a fire drill, we hope a fire never happens, but it's better to have a drill. You know, it's better to have a plan than to not have a plan. And hopefully you never need your plan, but you might need your plan. So here's what we're going to do. And um, I think um, at the beginning you can really talk about what are the kinds of symptoms that you see emerging first. And sometimes we do see that in an episode of mania, say, sleep disturbance is one of those kinds of uh, symptoms that may emerge early. And so you can really talk about, so what do we do if your sleep is disturbing? How do we talk to you about it? And what should we, how should we approach this? You know, and so you have a plan for that. And then if symptoms get worse, let's say we talk about your sleep disturbance, but then you have more symptoms, what kind of um, actions do we take? And so you come up with sort of a plan where people can all feel comfortable with how that's going to proceed. Now, does this actually happen? You know, how, does this actually work in the moment? I think um, maybe not 100%, but it can really reduce a lot of conflict when you can say to the person, you know, remember, a, you know, a few months ago we talked about what we would do in cases when you were showing this kind of behavior, these kinds of symptoms. This is what we talked about. I think this is what we're seeing now. So you can refer back to their their own um, agreement earlier on, and I think uh, it helps you get a little traction uh, on that. Um, obviously, Susan, you uh, have some expertise in the mental health law, and I know that there are, you know, the written uh, uh, legal directives that you can take. There's there's legal actions that you can take in terms of mental health directives, but I think I think here we're really talking more about coming up with a plan that includes family members, that includes patients, that includes mental health professionals, so that you really can think about how you're going to handle things. And then the person doesn't feel like it's being sprung on them in quite the same way. Um, and for us, I'm not sure if that's just a question. 
It does. I mean, for us at Families for Depression Awareness, the thing that we really appreciate about having these documents is um, not only that there's already been some thought put into it, but that it's pretty clear on the expectations of each person. Like, if if the person with bipolar disorder needs to go to you know the the clinician, then who would be the one to take them? And you know, just so that yeah. there's um, mm-hmm. it it avoids some mm-hmm. of the kind of uh, heightened anxiety that people might have in the situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things that I found um, so useful too is sometimes there's a, a person who talks to them better in these periods of time than another person. And if you could talk about that ahead of time, like who who would be the best person to talk to you? Who do you feel most comfortable talking to? That can really, um, even those kind of decisions can can um, sort of smooth things at the time of symptom emergence. So, Pada, um, in our previous conversation, I learned that your mother did not have a care plan. What was that like for you? Um. I think not having a care plan meant that every time there was a, an episode or every time, um, you know, she started having increased symptoms, we had to go through the same thing. And and she was very reluctant to even admit that she had a disorder. Um, so we'd end up, you know, in, in these states, right, when she was in these states. So, you know, it was always a sort of uncertainty and confusion and like, you know, what are we going to do and how are we going to convince her to do, you know, to to – take some action to get some treatment. Um, so, you know, the, it was it was very hard. Um, and we had nothing to go back to, right? We had nothing that we had agreed on or anything like that. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, kind of second guessing and questioning. And like, you know, my sister and I would be like, you know, think she's okay? No, she's not okay. And then, you know, we would, ha- you know, try to ask her, but whenever we asked her, she wouldn't want to, you know, engage that conversation. So. Um, and then as the symptoms got worse, it got harder. So um, I think having an agreement, you know, is, is at least a, a step for being able to, you know, communicate more effectively and, you know, be able to ha- have some better outcomes. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Sounds good. Um, okay, we've covered some of those important general topics. So let's turn to some particular situations that, caregivers, including those on the line now, uh, might be facing with regard to their loved one's bipolar disorder. So let's start with one of the defining features of uh, bipolar disorder, lack of insight. Uh, Dr. Thompson, as the clinician, can you talk Mm -hmm. some about what this lack of insight is? Well, I think we, we talk about this as anosognosia, which is a big word which basically means in real life. Uh, but people with bipolar disorder don't have a lot of insight into their disorder. And I think this is more characteristic than uncharacteristic people with bipolar disorder. So this is often what we see, um, particularly as symptoms begin to ramp up. I think with manias, mania, the beginning of the mania, that hypomanic period feels good. It feels right to folks. And they often don't see that this is part of the bigger picture and that they're, you know, they're ramping up. Um, I think, again, this gets back to why advanced directives and the sort of relapse uh, uh, drill is so important because you can basic, you can identify when the person is euthymic or, you know, uh, regular mood state, you can identify what are those emergent symptoms so that then when you see them, you can say, these are the things we were talking about. Um, so that, 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 again, that advanced planning I think is really, really important. Um, I think it's important not to necessarily, I think one of the things that's really important is that we as caregivers, I think people who are caregivers, see something very different than the person with bipolar disorder. And we remember things very differently. And so those I think are um, uh, important reasons for that sort of lack of insight. Um, that the person isn't able to see themselves from the outside in quite the same way. Yeah, um, one of the things that uh, I have had uh, somewhat uh, intense conversations with is the idea of people from the um, lived experience community that 
you know, it's really important to have the advanced directive. You should have the advanced directive. But the phone calls we get here, people don't have advanced directives, so they don't have care plans. And yes, so they're absolutely. in the situation. They're in the situation. They don't have an agreement or a plan. How do they handle this when their loved ones just don't recognize that there's a problem? How do you convince someone that they need help? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, th I think one of the things is being very clear in your language. So you say something like, this, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that you're not sleeping. I'm seeing that you're talking very fast. I'm seeing that it's harder for you li to listen, and I'm beginning to see that it's hard for you to pay attention. Um, these are signs that are of concern, and I think this is a time when we need to see the doctor. So being very clear about what you're seeing, um, I think having that additional arbiter, you say maybe it's the doctor, maybe it's the minister, maybe it's somebody else. Um, but uh, so that it doesn't become between, uh, uh, that it isn't some manifestation of just a relationship problem we're having, but that I can say, this is what I'm seeing. I think we need a, a second opinion, not just mine, but a second opinion. I think is a very helpful way to go. Pada? I don't know, Pada, if um, you have additional I, I thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think one thing is that um, you know so, sometimes in addition to find, finding another arbiter, you need to find people. Um, and I think Susan mentioned this before that you know our allies, caretaking allies, um, and people with outside people with influence. You know, you know, it might be you know like my mom's best friend, for instance, or you know something like that, or the minister or someone like that. Um, and those people can be allies both for the person with bipolar disorder and also for you as a caregiver. Um, because, I mean, yes, yes. you know, I think care, you know, caregivers need to have their perspective validated. At least I, I needed my perspective validated. My sister did that for me, um, you, know, it's, you know, because it, it, sometimes it's, it's, it's unclear what's going on. Absolutely. And I have, and I, I have, have to seen say change. that um, the conflict, the key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, just real quickly, um, I have to say that the number of questions that we received about uh, what do you do when your loved one denies that they have bipolar disorder, they don't believe their diagnosis, how do you convince someone they need help? I mean, this is, there were just so many of these that it's obviously yeah. uh, an extremely common issue for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you hear people say, it happened, well, this happened this one time I was in the hospital, but it's never going to happen again. I I've got it under control for that kind of thing. And that, that is also very, very difficult to deal with. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, think, right. I think being able to say, you lo I, I love you, and this, you know, I've, you know, I've been your parent, your, your daughter, whatever, for a long and and, you know, I, I, I know that this is not how I experience you most of the time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know I mean, like mm -hmm. I, I, my perspective yeah. um, is not just as someone new. It's someone with some history. And mm -hmm. I, you know, who knows? But it, it is really hard. It, I mean, yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to I think some particular states. Let's yeah. Let's go. Okay. Let me talk. Let, let's talk first about um, mania. We know that mania can bring on behaviors mm -hmm. like gambling or sexual promiscuity and days without need for sleep and irritability and anger and sometimes a sense of infallibility or impulsive spending, you know, impulsiveness in many ways. So how can a caregiver deal with these manic behaviors? Um, Dr. Thompson, you have some ideas on that? Well, going back to planning ahead when someone is in a well state, I think uh, one of the things is to think about what has happened in previous episodes and, you know, in making that care plan, that relapse drill, whatever we want to call it, to think about the issues that have come up. So if you find that you have a family member who does a lot of excessive spending when they're manic, maybe the caregiver says, when I see these symptoms emerging, maybe we're going to have to call and cancel the credit card or find ways to limit the impact of these, these dangerous behaviors. I think, um, and sometimes that can be conflict inducing. So during an episode, you may say, well, you know, I'm going to cancel the credit card. You may get, oh, you can't do that, you know, and, and that's, that's uh, wrong and that, 
you know, can lead to a real conflict. On the other hand, not doing it, um, the, the, the conflict, I think, in those cases is a short-term pain for a very strong long-term gain, which is not having devastating financial impacts on your family. So sometimes um, if you can agree on these things in advance, you know, if you're having a manic episode, here's some of the things I'd like to be able to do to make sure that our family is is not going to suffer some, you know, adverse consequences. On the other hand, there may be times where you just need to take those steps. You need to take the car keys um, and make sure that they're not available to the individual. Or there may be times where you have to call police if someone is in danger. And, you know, that uh, is not something anyone enjoys, but I think it can be something that's essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually had an experience where I had to call the police, um, and or actually I, I told the neighbor to just call the police because they were calling me because my mother was being disturbing. Um, and it, it's very hard. I mean, for me, emotionally, it was hard to say you, know, you have to call the police. Um, you know, um, on the other hand, I knew that I, uh, I could not um, fix the manic state, right? I couldn't fix the behaviors that were being problematic. I couldn't do, I, and, and there's nothing I could say to my mom in that state that would make a difference. There's nothing. So, um, so, you know, for me personally, it was, it was mm -hmm. very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I knew I had to do that because, uh, you know, the, the other options, we had no other options. And it was, you know, um, the sort of the, sometimes for my mom's safety, you know, I, you know, if the police would have to be called or, or you know, she would have to be, um, you know, committed to a hospital or something like that, be, you know, and I think we, obviously planning ahead, but a lot of times that you can't plan ahead, it just, you know, things are there and there you are in the middle of the the, the, the manic state and, you know, you don't have a, a, a care plan. So, um, you know, what you're doing is you're just trying yeah. to figure out how to manage the states, the manic state, and then, I mean, we're going to talk next about depressive mm -hmm. state, but yeah, but all the different mm -hmm. states and then trying to figure out what the best action is. Mm -hmm. So you got to do what you got to do. That's right. Yep. Um, someone uh, asked the question about how to deal with um, outbursts that, you know, when someone is in this manic state and they like just take it out on them. Mm -hmm. Any ideas on that? Mm. I, I would say leave. Yeah. I mean, I would say put a boundary down. I and mean, that's what I've had to do. I've had to say, you know, I can't yeah. stand here and, and have you shout at me. I'm going to have to take, I'm going to have to leave right now. I'll be back. I love you. You know, but this behavior is not acceptable to me right now. Or at all, or yeah, yeah, because it can't. Um, and I, you know, I can come back when um, we can talk more calmly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I right. agree with that. Or if all you right. feel physically threatened, I think it is. You can call the police. That is a very appropriate time to call. You know, because that's mm -hmm. a, that's certainly a limit that we all should have is our own physical safety. Yes. Yeah. All right. So let's flip to the other poll. Um, a depressive state. What's important here? Uh, what do you think, Pada? Um, you know, I think it's really important to reassure um, the person in the depressive state that you know you're not going to go that and you're not going to go away. You're not going to leave them. You're going to help them find care and reassure them that you know this is this will pass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not forever, and mm -hmm. uh, you know we're doing the best we can. Mm -hmm to, you know, reduce the symptoms so they can come out of the depressive state and, you know, become healthy again. Absolutely. I think families uh, have such an important role to play in supporting treatment involvement. So, you know, helping the person make sure that they can get to treatment regularly. Um, uh, but I also think one of the things that's really hard about depression is we think of depression as people feeling sad all the time or feeling unhappy. But one of the sort of uh, the truths about depression is that oftentimes mood is irritable in depression. We certainly see this in teens and young adults, but we also see this, you know, late in, in later in adulthood 
where the person who is depressed may be sad and miserable, but they also may be very irritable with those around them. And I think sometimes that's one of the hardest symptoms to deal with because the irritability isn't about you, but it's directed at you. So it feels, I think, particularly um, hard to manage. Um, and one thing that that people are not necessarily familiar with, or at least they don't know that it has a name, is uh, the mixed state. And um, that is when mm-hmm. mania uh, is accompanied by depressive symptoms or depressive, uh, you know, in a, dep- a depressive episode is accompanied by symptoms of mania. And they can be uh, simultaneously, they can be in rapid succession, um, but uh, mm-hmm. it's this time in bipolar disorder that is um, particularly difficult uh, for the person with bipolar disorder and um, and from what I have heard feels very out of control and frightening. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. short that makes them distressing, um, but they're a challenge for family members also. So... Um, you know, number one would be to keep the person safe. Uh, there's a heightened risk to physical safety, and um, yep. I think that all we can say is that there's really a, a pressing need to get professional care. Mm-hmm. Anything that people need to add to that? No. That says I think it. it covers that. Um, another... Yeah, I think okay. so. Okay. Um, another thing that people are not necessarily aware of are the cognitive issues that can occur with any mood mm-hmm. disorder, but um, here in this case with um, with bipolar disorder, you know, a person's ability to think in a, variety, in a variety of ways can be affected, like reasoning, making decisions, organizing, um, paying attention, concentrating, and as we know from already, uh, remembering. So uh, even when a person with bipolar disorder has reached stabilization with their mood state, we know that these cognitive issues can persist. And and I know that this is um, frustrating for a lot of people. You know, you seem well, how come you're not doing this? You seem well, um, can't you do better in school or at work? Um, And it also means that caregivers don't, get the relief that they probably are waiting for because they still need to be the ones who remember things, who make sure that appointments get, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that people get to appointments. Um, And so uh, just trying to support the person in becoming more fully fully functional, I think, is is the challenge. Um, Padit, have you had any experience with this? Yeah, um, my mom um, would just forget big portions of things that, you know she did when she was in an episode, um, and you know, and things that were somewhat hurtful. You know, I mean, she would say things, or she would. One time, she gave away a whole bunch of pot, pottery I'd made just randomly to people she didn't even know in her building. She just left it in people's doors and things, and she didn't remember this at all. Um, and you know, it, it's very, it's hard because I mean, she was, you know, kind of giving away her prize things, and then she wonders where they went, and that's even harder too, because then I have to explain what happened, and she doesn't really believe me. So, um, so it can be very frustrating. And but her experience of the the what happened is different than my experience of what happened, um, because she doesn't remember. Um, and I think that 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 can be really really hard. Um, it's also um. I think I think it's important for um, you know it has been important for me to do things like write things down, you know, just so so I mm-hmm. I keep, keep track of what happened. Um, and I, I I'm a big journal writer, so I think that that can be really important um, just as a record. Even if you're not a big journal writer, you could just jot down notes in a calendar, like you know this is what happened, and you know. Um, um, because I think sometimes it, it can be hard uh, to talk about later, and at least if you have some notes and, and you, know, you, you know what 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 happened and what you're going to say. And um, because I do think again, coming back to a time when there's more stability, and, and and even when there is more stability, being able to say, you know, sometimes these things carry over. And I know that from my own life too. So. 
Oh. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in that kind of situation, uh, you can't really be angry with them, but it's yeah. a lot for someone in your position to carry. So, Dr. Thompson, you know, how can someone who is a caregiver when their loved one is more well um, convey h- how challenging this has been? You know, it, it's, this is such a hard thing because I think this is what the, what really can contribute to conflicts in families with bipolar disorder because the family is saying, you did these things, you scared us to death, and the person's like, uh, you're trying to control my life, and, um, and, 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 and I didn't do those things, and I, I couldn't have done those things. And, and, and uh, it can be very frustrating, I think, for families because they're uh, memory of state dependence. And things that happen when you were in a manic state are not necessarily remembered when you're in a non-manic state. And things that happen when you were depressed aren't necessarily things you're going to remember. So in so many ways, this is, this is, it's natural that these things aren't remembered, but I think it, for, and sometimes I think for the person with bipolar disorder, it almost makes it easier because they don't have to remember some of the worst parts of it. Unfortunately for caregivers and family members, they remember everything, sometimes in, in, in horrific detail, um, things that were terrifying, potentially really very upsetting. Um, I think that um, one of the ways to handle this with family members is to be pretty direct. Without guilting, I think you can say, you know, when you were ill, um, you engaged in this and this and this behavior, and that was very, very frightening to me. And um, I wanted you to know how I felt about it or, you know, so I would like to not have that happen again. So you want to be able to express those feelings and it's fair to express those feelings, and a good thing, I think, without uh, trying to guilt, but being honest with those kinds of experiences. Um, I think you also sometimes get this kind of feeling from people with bipolar disorder after an episode. They feel like family are watching them. I've heard patients say, well, I feel like, you know, I'm I'm in a terrarium and everyone's standing around like the you know, I'm under a magnifying glass. Everyone's looking at everything I do. If I have a happy day, are you manic? If I have a sad day, are you depressed? And I can't have any emotional experiences. And I think part of this is that going back to that idea of the trauma and um, that that families are traumatized at some level and they are doing what traumatized people do is they're looking out for signs that it could be coming back or something could be happening. So, um I think it's very important to be to be honest about those kinds of kinds of experiences. Um, and and One, uh, other than being defensive, uh, what's a fair expectation of how the person with bipolar disorder could respond? Hmm. That's a good One question. Thing I'm sure that, they can um, respond in lots of that they don't understand. Go ahead. I mean, I was just thinking one of that, the things I think, that, you know, but I was just going to say, one of the things is that um, that there can be, I mean, bringing things up that the person doesn't remember could also um, trigger some a shame response, I think, sometimes. Um, I, I found out with my mom, like, mm-hmm. I, would say, I would say, look, this is, I, I'm not trying to guilt you, I'm not trying to shame you, but this is what happened. But still, that response of being yeah, so embarrassed yeah. Yeah, and so absolutely. ashamed. That yeah. that they that she did these things. It was almost intolerable for her and and for me too. So I mean that might be mm-hmm. something to bring into a family yeah. therapy session, for instance. Yeah. Um, you know, because it is really yeah. tough stuff. I think it is very tough stuff. Yes, um, but you know that's a lot of what we're yeah. talking about <laughs> tonight. But you can um, yeah, you can see right, why no. someone might want to deny some of those things. You know hard to accept that one behaved in particular ways sometimes. All right. Scooting along. This is something we hear about a lot, estrangement from the family, whether it's that the family needs to take steps to protect themselves and, you know, cut the person off until they um, are not engaging in certain behaviors any longer, or if the person with bipolar disorders says, uh, I can't be with you all now. 
you know, um, uh, it's not easy either way. Uh, but sometimes it's necessary. Uh, Pada, do you have thoughts you can share? Yeah. Um, my father ended up divorcing my mom, um, you know, in part for lots of reasons, but in part because she struggled so much with the bipolar. And I think, you know, for his well-being, he had to leave. I mean, it was hard on the family, obviously, because, you know, I mean, there were kids involved, me and my sister and whatever. So, um, you know, I, I think – I do think that um, that there are responsible ways to leave if you have, you know, if you have to make that separation, um, and part of it has to do with trying to make sure that person has some support. I mean, do they have a doctor? Are you leaving them, you know, without any support? Um, you know, and really trying to be, res you know, respectful of that too. Um, and you need to know your limits um, because you cannot. Yeah, you know, as we said before, you can't you can't save them. Um, and loving someone doesn't mean you have to accept their destructive behaviors and stay in the situation. You know that sometimes you do have to leave, and sometimes the person with bipolar will leave, um, and you can't you can't chase them. You can't you know you can't you, um, you just have to be able to to say, well, I'm you know I'm still here. You know, when you come back, if, if they leave, you know, and, and, and as well as saying, you know, this is what I can do if I have to leave. Mm -hmm. Yep. So can these rifts be mended, Dr. Thompson? I, I think so. I think not always, um, but sometimes um, they can be. And I think sometimes when we set these kinds of limits, it can create um, a moment of insight for folks, and they can really sort of have that moment where they have to uh, face their um, behaviors and think about what they're, what this is costing them, what they're potentially losing. Um, I think, too, some things can't be compromised. Uh, family safety, family well-being um, are, are things that can't be compromised um, for bipolar disorder. So I think there are times where, you know, you have to set those limits, but I think keeping lines of communication open, um, if the person isn't in, in contact, uh, continuing to reach out, sending those birthday cards, those holiday cards, those, those uh, if it's a text, if it's uh, whatever it is, um, you know, reaching out and letting them know that you're still there and that, you know, you'd like to have, uh, continue to have that relationship. Um, and I, I've seen it where it took, it took a long time, and there was a long period of estrangement. But then over time, it can be mended, especially if there was a relationship there that was really important to the person in the first place. Um, I think this is something that parents can sometimes experience, and it's a very painful, painful experience. All right, let's move on to um, treatment kinds of issues. Um, there's um, an average delay of six years from when symptoms start to the time that people get a diagnosis on average. Um, Dr. Thompson, why is that and how can family members support proper diagnosis and treatment? Oh, there's so many reasons. I think part of it is this is an episodic illness and so people go through episodes and then they come out of these episodes um, uh, a lot of times uh, treatment providers don't have information. They may not have a good history of the person. People who have bipolar disorder aren't always the best at being able to uh, report their symptoms. We rely a lot on um, having information about a person's history because bipolar disorder is really only able to be diagnosed when you can really get a good history and you see the presence of depression and you see the presence of these meanings and you see the cyclicity, the cycles involved. And so we don't always have all of that information. Um, we also know that symptoms, symptoms emerge over time. I think, if you, you know, if you make a sort of an analogy to a medical illness, you know, you may have the flu, but we don't always diagnose it easily at the beginning. So you may start with a fever, but you don't have other symptoms. And so sometimes the, the symptoms of bipolar disorder begin to emerge in a gradual fashion. So you have a person who has seen this where 
sleep disorder uh, is really the first symptom. But sleep disorder alone isn't going to tell us that this is bipolar disorder. And then you begin to see some of the other kind of hypomania kinds of symptoms that begin to emerge over time. And we can only really diagnose bipolar when all of these things begin to coalesce into a, a syndrome picture. And then we can say, okay, this looks like bipolar disorder. Um, I think it's super important to get families input during this process because families have the ability to observe uh, the person who's experiencing the symptoms in ways that sometimes the person doesn't. So they can provide uh, some accurate reporting. They can um, share relevant family history. They can talk about medications that have been tried and haven't been tried. Um, so I think that uh, family involvement here is, is really crucial. Uh, we got a couple of questions about involvement of uh, family members in treatment. For example, what type of clinician mm -hmm. should my daughter be going to that will work with both of us as a team? Is there a professional protocol for involvement of family members in treatment? Can you talk about that? Because I know that's your work. Well, you know, I don't I, – protocol, I'm not sure in the sense that – I'm not sure a lot of physicians do this. I think there is uh, the most – one of the most evidence-based treatments for bipolar disorder is family-focused treatment. Um, it's shown um, strong effects on management of bipolar disorder in many clinical trials um, with lots of different populations of folks. So I think it's very evidence-based. Um, it's really the focus of family of a family focused treatment approach is to educate families so that they really understand what bipolar disorder is, the causal factors, uh, kind of contributing factors, they understand uh, uh, course, they understand available treatments. And then in that kind of in this kind of family focused treatment model, you also work on helping families develop skills for managing it. So you uh, I, as a treatment provider, might help families work on their communication skills. We work on problem-solving skills, and then we take these communication problem-solving skills to directly address symptoms. So we, we work on those relapse drills, that the planning that goes into it, and really try to facilitate an open communication between folks. I think that um, so this is really a disorder that affects the family profoundly. And the, the good thing, the good news is that the family has the capacity, I think, to really help the person uh, with bipolar disorder to have a more stable course. Um, but they, but nobody, nobody sort of wakes up uh, in life and knows how to help someone deal with their bipolar disorder. This is something that families have to learn. They have to develop skills. And it's very personal. It has, the treatment has to be tailored for individual families because uh, no, uh, no two folks are exactly the same, and that is absolutely true of bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder looks very different in different individuals. So, how does I hope someone that answers not in that the greater Boston somewhere. area. Um, how does someone not in the greater Boston area find uh, a provider that practices uh, family-focused therapy? This is a really, really good question. Um, there are some, like the, uh, hmm. there may be, there's a, at MGH, they have a really good bipolar uh, clinic and research program, and they uh, may have resources for, in terms of that. Um, so that is a good way. The uh, uh, Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies also has a, a clinician referral service, and there are folks through that who are treated in family-focused treatment. I do think it's a problem that we don't have um, enough training. We, we need more folks really trained in these kinds of procedures. I think that's, that's a real important goal in terms of mental health treatment more generally for bipolar disorders, to really get people trained in these kinds of evidence-based treatments. If there's a if, if if anybody wanted to email me, um, you know, uh, personally, you're welcome to do so, and I may be able to find a provider who could 
be helpful in this regard. That's very kind of you. Um, I think what we'll do at Families for Depression Awareness is we'll put a little um, uh, effort into finding people, uh, and we'll mm -hmm. put up a blog post, uh, and we'll and we'll advertise it on social media. So mm -hmm. we will try to get that up within the Maybe next Maybe you and I can so. sit down and find some folks as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can, I, can I say one thing um, uh, about? Um, you betcha. Okay, about um, therapists and looking for therapists. Um, I think as a, you know, as a consumer, if you will, <laughs> um, uh, you, you need to realize that you can interview the therapist too. You, you're not, I mean, a lot of times I think people feel like they, you know, go to a clinic and they get assigned a therapist and that's it. But yeah. sometimes that therapist doesn't work out and or the therapist Absolutely. is not as family focused as you want them to be or whatever. Um, you know, I actually developed, and I'm happy to share this with you, Susan, and you can do it, you know, a, a form that's an interview guide for consumers to ask questions of therapists about, you know, what, what is, what is oh, your great. theoretical background? You know, do you deal with families? Do you deal with whatever other things that mm -hmm. might be part mm -hmm. of your family, like, uh, you know, mixed religious, you know, religious backgrounds in the family or whatever, right? And to know this stuff up front from a therapist can be really helpful. Um, uh, you know, like, do, have they thought about this? Is it part of their practice? You know, do they see families that look like mine? Um, you know, so I think that that empowering oneself to, when, in the choice of therapists, um, in addition to, you know, uh, it can be helpful too, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds great, and uh, we'll look forward to getting that from you. We also, on our website at familywear.org, uh, under the Help Someone, uh, we do have uh, questions to ask of, uh, you know, someone who might be a provider for you or someone for whom you are a caregiver. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Um, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit um, because we don't want to run out of time before we get to some questions, although admittedly I've been working them in, so uh can't feel that bad. Um, getting and staying well are often challenging for people living with bipolar disorder and their families. Um, I've seen great disappointment when a person with bipolar disorder seems to be doing well but then experiences an episode or decides to stop taking their medication. How can family caregivers manage this, Dr. Johnson? Well, I, Susan, I think one of the things that's really important is that just because a person has an episode doesn't mean they messed up or the treatment has failed. I think this is an episodic recurrent disorder. And so there will be times, even when the person is taking medication religiously, that they may have a breakthrough episode, mania or depression, despite being really conscientious of the treatment plan. The treatment plans are not perfect. It's, it's, so it's not as clean as it looks. It's not that the person, you know, screwed up. Um, and I think that's really important to recognize. Um, I think uh, in terms of stopping taking medication, this is extraordinarily common in people with bipolar disorder. And I, I would actually conject, I would actually put forth that this is an expected part of treatment because it happens with most people who have bipolar disorder. They, get, they come to a point where they're feeling pretty okay. And taking a medication to prevent something feels very different to folks than taking a medication to treat something. And that's what these medications, these mood stabilizers are for a lot of folks is that you're on something that's preventing something. Um, one of the things that we found that was really useful in our treatment with families was to actually predict non-adherence to medication. So patients oftentimes after an episode in the hospital would say, oh, no, no, I'll take my medication for the rest of my life. And we would say something like, well, you know, we hope that's true. It's a good thing. Medication is a good thing. It's uh, for most patients, it's really uh, essential for good management of bipolar disorder. However, we would bet that there's going to come a point where you might not feel that way anymore. There may come a point where you don't want to take the medication anymore. And what we'd like you to do is to come and talk to us when that stage happens. Um, so what we're trying to do there is to recognize the reality, which is that this is a normal part of treatment. This is something that typically happens, but we'd rather have it be something that we can discuss rather than something that the person does on the fly. Um, because if we if they bring it in for discussion, we can talk about their reasons. Is it because it, it makes them feel deadened inside in some way? 
Is it a side effect that needs to be dealt with? Um, what is it about the medication? And sometimes we can really address those issues and keep people on their meds. So I think not seeing this as, as a failure is really important. Um, and on the theme of not a failure, uh, sometimes there are um, circumstances under which someone really does need to go to the hospital um, if they're um, – if there's a threat of harm to themselves or others, if they're having hallucinations, if they haven't slept for days, uh, mm -hmm. if they're just not functioning. Um, so uh, I think when we had talked before that you had said that this is also not a failure. No, I think it's an expected part of treatment. Yeah, I think there's a, it's like, like a lot of chronic medical conditions that are relapsing and that are episodic, there may be times when a person does need to be in the hospital for, to help stabilize them. And I think that is not a failure. It is a normal part of treatment. Um, it's not a, a part of treatment any of us wants to have happen. Um, but it's, um, it's not the worst thing that can happen. Um, it's an expected thing. And I think if we can frame it in that way, uh, instead of seeing it as, oh, you failed, um, it's a disaster. Um, then I think it's, it's easier to recover from. It's easier to move on and say, okay, this happened, and now we're going to get, you know, we're going to get back to back to the place we need you to be. And this is a part of getting to the place that uh, where you need to be. Well, speaking of getting to the place, do you have any uh, advice on the practical issue of how to actually get someone to the hospital? Oh, they say, I don't want to go. I think, you know, yeah. I think this is, again, if we can go back to that idea of having the care plan, the advanced directive discussion, the uh, relapse drill, whatever we want to call this, those discussions are really important. Um, if you can have them in advance, you're better off because then you can go back and you can say, you know, this is one of those situations we talked about before where we agreed that if you were starting to show these symptoms that this would be a time to go to the emergency room and get checked out. And we don't know if this really, you know, is something that needs um, more intensive care, but it might. Um, and so this would be the time to do it. Um, of course, that doesn't always work <laughs> in the middle of a severe episode. Um, I think what you do want to do is you want to give people uh, options, limited choices. You can say, well, we could go over to the Beth Israel Deaconess, or we could go over to MGH, or we could uh, call, um, if there's mobile services in your area, we'll call what we in Massachusetts would call the Beth team um, and have them come, or we could go to the hospital. Which one would you prefer? So you can give folks choices that are limited and that clearly one choice is not to do nothing. That's not a choice. Um, but they still may have some choices in, in, in how you want to handle that. Now, if there is danger to self or others, I think you are well within um, your right to call 911. That is sometimes the, um, the safest and, and only thing choice you really have. But where there's choices possible, I think um, you want to give the person some sort of feeling of control over the situation where possible. And I would um, say just I'm be sure to have please. permission. Oh, can I say one thing? Just be sure to have permission to talk yep. to the doctors because, um, you know, yeah. I mean, as, if you're a parent, then you have that. But if, if you know, like, you know, I mean, if you're, you know, partner with someone and you're not legally married, for instance, you would, you would need to have permission to be able to talk to the doctors and it would be good to get that beforehand. Or if uh, your child is clear, when you talk about, I was going to say that it doesn't matter if you're a parent if your if your child is 18 or older. Uh, so yes, oh, that's, uh, yes that's I will correct. touch on that when we get to the when we speak incredibly briefly about legal issues. But let me just um, <laughs> mention to people that there are alternatives to emergency departments in many communities, and uh, I would urge that you. Um, check out what some of these are in your community, and um, you know maybe even visit them or learn more about them with your loved one who has bipolar disorder, so that they can say, you know, like if if you're not stable, but it's not like incredibly 
crisis, um, then we can try going to this health center. Or um, uh, there's one model called the living room. There are peer support specialists. So just uh, find out what's available in your community as an alternative. And then with regard to in inpatient care, I mean, I know a lot of people say, I don't want to be locked up. Well, you know, there are sometimes when it's necessary for uh, safety, but uh, it's not always. Um, Dr. Thompson, what might be reassuring for people? I think one of the things uh, to really emphasize with the, the patient at this time is to say, look, we want you to be able to get a really good evaluation and to uh, address this problem sooner. Because the sooner we can get you and then we get that medication adjusted, the less time you're going to spend there. And I don't want to see you locked any, up any more than you do, but I want you to get the care that you need. I can't promise that they're not going to put you in the hospital if you go get care, but there may be other alternative treatment options. There's a continuum of psychiatric care. So there may be crisis residencies, there's partial and day programs, there's lots of different options. And what we need to do is get you clearly evaluated so we can figure out what the best option for you is right now. Because the more, the sooner we can get the care, the less likely it is that you're going to end up being locked up for a period of time. And I, so I think there you're really um, helping them to see that they can be part of the process of this decision. Perfect. Uh, so the other, one of the other problems that comes up is that people just run out of resources. Uh, they they don't have money. So. Um, the kinds of advice that we can give include, you know, talking with the clinicians or the providers. Are there other treatment approaches that can be uh, tried that could be effective? Um, ask about sliding scale fees and payment plans. Press your health insurance company for coverage. Appeal when necessary and take it to the end. I mean, honestly, I can't tell you how many times um, people have said, you know, I'm going to challenge this, and then they prevail. And those are the kinds of things that we want to see, um, you know, not to get into the whole healthcare thing, but um, having mental health coverage is required under the Affordable Care Act, and you should be receiving um, mental health benefits that are on par with uh, medical benefits. Um, we have another webinar you can watch about that, but, you know, just... Um, you know, follow what you can. Um, you may qualify for care through your State Department of Mental Health. There may be community or nonprofit groups that can help support uh, care. And, um, you know, you can also try participating in a clinical trial. Uh, there are not necessarily great answers, but there are at least some things to try. All right. Um, this is something that I really don't want to cheat on time, but we're – and we're running tight, so we're going to um, – go into it, because this to us is really one of the most important things. Um, we emphasize the need for caregivers to practice self-care because caregivers are often under a great deal of stress. It can have adverse effects on you physically and emotionally. Uh, you're likely to have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, a tendency to be overweight more so than non-caregivers. You can be at higher risk for depression, chronic illness, and um, a decline in your quality of life. So please, do what you can to take care of yourself. Um, Pata, you've had experience in being a caregiver. Can you share with others? Um, what, what would you share? I, I mean, I think being a, I would share that you have to make self-care as part of your lifestyle and, and to see it as a long-term thing you have to do, you know, because otherwise you don't have anything to give the person with bipolar. Uh, you know, if you're depleted, you're depleted. So, I mean, I've done a lot of things myself. I mean, I have a therapist that, that I see um, both, you know, for my own depression as well as, you know, for the caregiving stresses because there's a lot of stress. Um, but I, And I, I do, you know, a lot of other kinds of care things. Art, I ride my bike, I cycle, I, you know, I, and some of this stuff I think is really important because it helps me process my experiences in, you know, within the relationship with my mom. And it helps me figure out, you know, that I'm okay, you know. Um, and, but, it, but taking that time to do that is really important. Perfect. Uh, we we have on. some ideas for people. <laughs> we have some ideas for people. Um, use stress management tools and techniques. 
uh, here at Families for Depression Awareness. We recently did a webinar on coping with stress, and um, we had an expert on mindfulness uh, who demonstrated some uh, exercises that you can do uh, that don't necessarily take all of your day. So, um, you know, we tried to do it for busy people. Uh, take care of your own health. See the doctor when you need to. We believe in the acronym C. Uh, so get adequate sleep, get adequate exercise, and eat um, in a uh, responsible way. Uh, nurture yourself with activities that help you to relax. Let others help you. Ask for help. Um, get counseling to help with your own mental health. And um, you know, find a support group, and and uh, if it's not a support group, then you know, get support from your own circle of uh, friends, and um, you know, talk to a trusted counselor, friend, and you know, acknowledge your feelings. You have a right to all of them, whatever they may be. And then one of the really hard things to do is to set and protect your boundaries. Uh, there's a link here for a blog that uh, we found helpful. Um, you know, boundaries are needed for healthy relationships of all kinds, but, um, you know, the boundaries when someone uh, has uh, a bipolar disorder can be especially critical and yet especially difficult to stand behind uh, in, in a pinch. So, um, Dr. Thompson, do you have anything you can uh, give advice on? Well, I think setting, setting boundaries is really hard. I think the worst thing you can do, though, is set one and not follow through on it because then you're giving the message that the boundaries aren't important and it's, your, that you, it, it's okay to violate your boundaries. So I think it's really important to say, look, you know, um, you can't have access to the checkbook. You can't have access to the credit card. You can't, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to tolerate your going out all night and partying and, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there's there's things that you, and I think it can be heartbreaking to have to follow up on those things. You can say, you know, I'm going to have to leave the situation if these things don't happen. I won't be threatened. Whatever it is, those boundaries are really really important, and it's about respecting yourself. But I think that that's a very very challenging thing to do. But it's, I think I think key. Um, Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't think there's any way around article. it other than to say no, it's there's hard. No, yeah. It's just so, so hard. Yeah. It's yeah. hard, but it's really vital for your own self preservation and for, you know, maintaining your relationship with the person with bipolar disorder and protecting your family. So oh, yep, um absolutely. I am gonna zoom through some legal issues. This isn't a legal seminar, but we wanted to put these on your radar so that you have some sense of them. Um, once again, let's, uh, let's sing it together. Um, an advanced directive is key. The better you can plan, the better you'll be able to get care for your loved one, and um, hopefully the easier it will be. So it should be a written document. It should reflect their preferences and what they want to have happen. We cannot emphasize this enough. Please, please, if you take nothing else from this, um, know that the more you can prepare in advance and, and know what the person with bipolar dis disorder expects and hopes will happen, then um, the better off you'll be. You might need a lawyer. This is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, I am not a mental health lawyer. I'm not a practicing lawyer, but I am a lawyer. Um, I would say that lawyers can actually be really helpful sometimes, but the only one who's gonna be able to help you is someone who has experience in mental health law. Also better to consult with mm -hmm. them before a crisis happens so that you have them in your corner already, that you have a sense of what processes are available. You know, maybe they help you with drafting the advanced directive. Maybe they help you understand about guardianship and when that might be necessary and available. You know, and you can also explore local legal resources um, you know, there are issues about uh, competence and asset protection. So, um, you know, find someone that you can work with. Better to line someone up and not need them than to need them and not have someone. Finally, there are potential concerns. Um, 
the big one in our view is HIPAA and privacy. Uh, HIPAA is the federal law that has to do with uh, security and privacy of patient records. Um, the takeaway on this is that um, uh, clinicians will sometimes not understand what their um, uh, responsibilities are under HIPAA, but even if they can't engage in a conversation with you, they can hear what you have to say. And so say, you don't have to answer me, but I want you to know that these are the symptoms that I've seen. And, and that is important for you to know because you're the one who can talk with my loved one about it. And they're not going to be your mouthpiece, but this will help them in determining whether the treatment is appropriate, whether uh, there are any other interventions that need to be made. Uh, just know that communication is not always a two-way street. But one way to get around that is, I'm sorry, one way to have that work in your favor is to, um, you know, go with your loved one to their appointments, have them sign whatever they need to that um, c that provides their consent to, to their provider talking with you. Um, you know, presumably it's not an adversarial relationship. They know you want to be there to help them, so, uh, you know, get those consents in order. You know, there are consequences of impulsive behaviors. There are business decisions that can have significant impacts. There are spending sprees. There's gambling. So, you know, have a strategy for protecting your bank account. Uh, Dr. Thompson has referred to this multiple times. Uh, the other thing is that um, bipolar disorder is almost always a lifeline, lifetime um, illness. So uh, there could be changes to how your loved one can earn income, if at all. There may be changes to how often they can be in the workforce. So, um, you know, if they're able to work but need support, then look into what kinds of uh, uh, accommodations their employer can reasonably provide. Uh, they are required for employers of a certain size under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, there may be changes to your family income. Do not hesitate about finding out if federal and state benefits are available to you to supplement your income. Uh, they are there for a reason, and if you qualify for them, do take advantage of them. It's not, it's not abusing the system when it is um, justified and you meet criteria and you go through the process and they determine that, and, uh, that they are appropriate for you. So, um, you know, you pay into the system. If you're entitled to get benefits back out, then by all means do it. So that's my, you know, like minute and a half on the law. Uh, I will also just very briefly tell you about Families for Depression Awareness. I hope you've had an opportunity to look beyond our educational webinars to our website. But uh, you may know we help families recognize and cope with depression and bipolar disorder because we want people to get well, and we are a suicide prevention organization. We're a national nonprofit based in Massachusetts. We provide education, support, and training. We operate from the philosophy that um, depression and bipolar disorder affect the whole family. Uh, we aim our education primarily at family caregivers because we know that they are in the position to notice when something is not quite right and also in a position to do something about it. So um, if you know family caregivers who are in these kinds of situations, then by all means send them our way. Our website has loads and loads of information, including stories and interviews with experts and people just like us. Uh, you can find information on a lot of different topics. We have several free webinars that are available on demand. You can see what they are here, but also you can visit our educational webinars page and find more information about them. We have these online web tools that uh, of particular interest is this one about the mental health family tree because you can put in um, things that you know about people in your family and then you print it out and you take it to the clinician and they could say, oh, yes, I see that there's this whole line of people who have had, uh, you know, marital difficulties and, um, you know, other indicators of bipolar disorder. So uh, you can also take advantage of the um, depression bipolar disorder test, which is 
you know, based on validated surveys. So uh, it doesn't tell you for sure whether you have depression or bipolar disorder, but it can certainly help you uh, understand whether you need to go see a clinician for a full assessment. We have a variety of publications and guides. Uh, soon we'll be able to add the little picture of the new bipolar brochure that you will be able to receive when you do your, um, your survey for us. And um, just wanted to highlight that we have this teen depression program if you're in Massachusetts. We can do uh, teen depression workshops and bring out our teen speakers to meet with your group. So uh, be in touch with Kayland Arrington if you have interest in that. Uh, I am the um, editor of our um, blog, advocacy blog that we do with the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance um, called Care for Your Mind. It's um, worth a visit. Get on the, uh, the mailing list. We post once a week. And um, we have a bunch of resources. Since you can download these um, notes, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I would like to note that uh, someone from um, Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance uh, asked about what the best way is to advertise or get the word out about their um, support groups. This is the best way I would go with. So um, by all means, do uh, check out Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance and uh, the information they have for caregivers, but also their support groups for friends and family. Uh, there's also some books. You already heard me talk well of uh, Rebecca Wallace's book, but also there are some others here that may be useful to you. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Thompson and Patasui Moto for participating in this program. We had uh, support, support from uh, Dr. Gary Sachs, Dr. David Miklowitz, and Dr. Noreen Riley Harrington on developing the content. We also had these great volunteers who have experience uh, living with bipolar disorder and or being caretakers, caregivers for people with bipolar disorder. Uh, you can see their names here. I thank them as well as the people who gener generously shared their stories for our brochure. Uh, it helps people with depression and bipolar disorder to know that they're helping others. And so these people should feel very good about uh, what they've done. We are also very grateful to Allergan for their uh, grant support for this program and our work with bipolar disorder. And also thank you to all of you who have taken the time to join us uh, to watch this program. And um, we're able to do this work thanks to contributions from people like you. So. If you are inclined and able, we would certainly appreciate you making a donation to Families for Depression Awareness. Um, we have worked a lot of questions and answers into the program, so uh, we're not going to have a lot of time right now, if at all. Uh, I do want to refer you all to the survey uh, that um, if you can give us your input on our program, it will help us improve it for the future and we will send you our um, brochure. And um, I will ask a couple of questions, but I do want to point out the next steps. Complete the online evaluation, as I've spoken about. You know, take the depression bipolar um, test uh, and complete the mental health family tree. Just go to our website and click on Help Someone. And by all means, visit our website to learn more, volunteer, and donate. Um, we had um, a couple of questions that I just want to touch on because a whole lot of people had questions about, you know, why isn't my loved one getting better? How do I get my daughter to therapy? How do I get a person to take their medicines? My spouse is very abusive and we can't get his medications right. What can I do? How can I help someone manage without medication? Uh, is there a practical way to help someone who is self-destructing um, and move them toward healthier habits? How do I encourage exercise? Um, and how do I help my son? You know, so much of this is about helping our adult children. Dr. Thompson, um, you know, what can people do when their loved ones are just not moving along toward being better? Um, are there, I mean, yeah. I, we spoke about it some. Is there, can you reiterate some of that? I think, you know, part of it is to sort of reorient our goals. And sometimes our goals have to really be lowered in the short run 
That doesn't mean it's permanent. That doesn't mean it's forever. But I do think that sometimes being able to establish what are some simple goals, like if with the <clears throat> exercise thing, are there some things you might want to do together that could be enjoyable? Is it possible that maybe the person wants to, would be willing to, you know, go for some walks or uh, or something like that, um, walk the dog, whatever those things are. But I think sometimes we really have to think about this as a long-term process of rebuilding. And um, that may have to start in uh, at a pretty low level sometimes. And that's not something we want to think about, but I think sometimes it's essential to start there. Um. Long-term planning, uh, what can people expect? Uh, I mean, I know we talked about how there are a lot of things that are really hard. Are there things that people can look forward to? Okay. Can I, I think that we, um, you know, that taking things really a day at a time sometimes and yeah, I mean, I think I think that there are times when you know uh, a person is stabilized, but there are also times, even when they're not stabilized, that you can have a moment. And I I held on to those moments, you know, when my mother would would be lucid for a minute and then and say something, you know, very much like herself, you know, and it was funny or whatever, and I'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you know. So I think that that's that's just mm-hmm. one thought. Mm-hmm. I think people do get better. It takes time. It takes a lot of time sometimes, but people do get better. And I think getting good care, having a stable environment, um, there are many people with bipolar disorder who go on to live very worthwhile lives, very good lives, very rewarding lives. And their families can benefit from that as well. Absolutely. All right. Um, We know we got uh, some questions and answers, and uh, what we're going to do on our end is work on creating some blog posts that answer these, so stay tuned to our social media. Uh, We'll be letting them, uh, you know, we'll be posting them over the next, you know, I would say even month or so, just uh, so that we can give people uh, all the support and advice that we can. Uh, if someone is in a crisis situation, by all means, don't write us. Uh, do get care immediately, and that means calling 911. That means going to the hospital, and um, people should also know about uh, crisis support lines, uh, the biggest one of which is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So um, thank you all very much for joining us for this, and um We wish you all the best. Uh, It is, as we tape this, coming in on the holiday season, which is a difficult time for some, but we hope that uh, even if you are going through challenges, you do find some joy and that you have love in your life. Please take care. Thank you so much. Good night.